salvo, 200 yards short. Third salvo, on target. Long before Pearl Harbor, the Signal Corps of the United States Army knew it would take more than a telephone wire to connect this voice with all the other fighting units that had to hear it. They knew it would take radio transmission. Radio can reach these tanks wherever they are and tell them what's ahead. A radio transmitter could coordinate the movement of troops, bring tanks and infantry together at the right place at the right time. But it would have to be a mobile radio transmitter. And it would have to be a powerful transmitter to keep an unbroken contact between our forces on the ground, in the air, and on the sea. The control of widely separated forces, the timing of their action, the success of the attack, depends upon reliable radio communication. Yes, the Signal Corps engineers knew just what kind of a transmitter it would take to do the job. But the big problem was to locate a manufactured transmitter of a design that would come close to these requirements. In this pre-war Hallicrafter's HT4 transmitter, the Signal Corps found many of the answers. It was designed especially for amateur use. It was easily capable of worldwide communication using either code or voice. Another great advantage was the fact that this Hallicrafters unit had been on the market for several years. There was an opportunity to check its performance through the records of hundreds of America's hams. And these amateurs know good performance. It employed band switching in the exciter and driver stages, which made it possible to change frequencies very rapidly. Say W2USA, W4GWG calling 20. I'm sorry, I'm going to... 4GGO, W20 now, W2USA. The sensor of the top of the... Hello, 20, hello, 20. Last year, you stand by because I'm out in the control of making the station break. I want to get you to the... Anyone else calling? Calling 20. Anyone else calling any 20? 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 But I would like to... Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. This is W9WZE Chicago. W9WZE Chicago calling CQ for any 20 meter phone and standing by. Go ahead, please. Hello, W9WZE Chicago. Hello, W9WZE Chicago. This is W6QD, Los Angeles, California. W6QD, Los Angeles, calling W9WZE, Chicago. Go ahead, Bill. Hello, W6QD, Los Angeles, California. This is W9WZE, Chicago, coming back. Good evening, Herb. Your signals are coming in fine tonight. R5S9. By the way, Herb, what are you doing on 20-meter phone? I thought you always worked CW. Now let's hear something about that marvelous California weather, eh? Alaska, Australia, Europe, South Africa. These were regular, almost daily experiences in many amateurs' homes, where Hallicrafters were rapidly shrinking this old world of ours. The transmitter that serves the Army must be able to perform anywhere 
and under all kinds of unpredictable conditions. Up to this time, no one had ever thought seriously of putting this sensitive, finely balanced instrument on wheels and bouncing it around foxholes. What about vibration? Where would the power come from? The job of toughening up the HT4 to go to war fell on the shoulders of Bill Halligan, Bob Samuelson, Hallicrafter's chief engineer, and the hard-pressed technicians of the Signal Corps. There were few changes needed to adapt this unit to Army needs. There was good engineering and good sound construction in the set to start with. This was to be the new home for Hallicrafter's equipment. Everything needed to transmit and receive had to be packed into this small space. That would take some more good engineering. This demand was nothing new to these pioneers. There are no fixed limits in Hallicrafter's design or construction. There is always development, change, improvement. Many of the war adaptations were drawn from advanced developments that had been in the experimental stage for months. For example, in the pre-war model, plugging in a tuning unit might be quite a trick if the holes and the prongs couldn't get together. For the new signal core transmitter, guide channels made this tuning unit change quick, positive and held the units securely in place. In the pre-war model, the prongs on the tube were enough to hold it in place. But this won't do for hopping shell holes. A tube support or ring was added to lock the tube firmly in position so that no amount of bumping or vibration would move it. For stationary use, no special footing was needed to anchor the transmitter, but for rough riding in a truck, rubber shock-proof mountings were added. In the process of making the entire unit more rugged, this air padder was replaced by a new vacuum tube padding condenser. Rooftop antennas could be as large as the pre-war ham wanted to make them, but it was pretty obvious that a rigging such as this one would hardly do on the top of a signal core truck. The solution was in the use of whip antennas and in designing an antenna tuning unit which would efficiently transfer the output of the transmitter to the whip antenna. Throughout all of these changes, to adapt a peacetime transmitter to wartime requirements, the high quality standards of Hallicrafters were strictly maintained in workmanship, in design and construction, and especially in performance. When the Signal Corps inspected the first of Hallicrafters transmitters armored for war, they found what they were looking for, a high powered unit that had been made completely mobile one that delivered good, reliable performance under all conditions. The first big job had been done well. Then came the warning of another bigger job. Field reports indicate performance of SCR 299 exceeds expectation. Request you expedite production as much as possible. And in working man's English, that means Let's go on production. This is the plant in Clearing, Illinois, where mass production of the new SCR 299 mobile radio station was obtained on a scale never dreamed of before in this industry. The key men for this tremendous production job were selected from the ranks of the American radio amateurs. These men had the know-how the technical background and experience it took to get into action fast. This entire operation is headed by Herb Hartley, known to the amateur fraternity as W9WNG. This production was accomplished through the splendid cooperation of hundreds of loyal, skilled workers 
who realized how big the job ahead was and knew how to do it. It was achieved through the unfailing efforts of many suppliers and their thousands of workers who built the tubes, the transformers, the condensers, coils, insulators, the steel chassis, and all the other components that go in to make the SCR-299. And finally, the very design and construction of the transmitter lent itself to mass production better than any other pre-war domestic transmitter. The chassis was strong. There was room to work with sub-assemblies. This is the main assembly line, from the end of which come the completed transmitters. This is the feeder table for the main assembly line. Here the sub-assemblies are inspected or hooked up to other components. At the foot of the main assembly line, the transmitter looks like this. A steel base to which are added sockets for rectifier tubes. Then the bleeder resistor, which furnishes a constant load on the high voltage supply. Next, the filter choke and condensers, which supply direct current to the plate circuits of the transmitter. In wiring these parts, a great deal of time and work is saved by the use of preformed cables. The cables are cut, formed, and tipped all ready for installation. And here's the base assembly, completed in just a little more time than it's taken to show it. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the table, the power control panel is being assembled. These are the controls for filament voltage and modulator bias. The purpose of this panel is to group, within convenient reach of the operator, all the essential power controls. These cables here are cut to length and form over on the feeder table. Terminal lugs are soldered to the ends. Then all the other wires needed in the circuit are placed into position, bound together, so that soldering to terminals is the only operation needed in the final assembly. This is the power panel cable. When wiring is completed and the switches and fuses have been installed, the sides are joined to the power control panel, and this unit is ready to join the main assembly line. The transmitter begins to take shape as the base is joined to the power panel unit. Electric hoists are used for ease and accuracy in handling these parts. Now the main power transformer is set in place. This is the unit that steps up the input to the high voltage required to operate the final amplifier and modulator tubes. After the transformer is connected, the entire deck or base is hoisted to a dolly to make handling easier. There's high power equipment on this deck and it's heavy. The second deck contains the audio driver stage and modulator of the transmitter, which makes possible radio telephone operation. This entire unit, built in another plant, has been inspected on the feeder table and requires only a modulation transformer and the phone CW relay to be complete. The top deck of the transmitter, the radio frequency section, begins with the installation of the exciter assembly, which is fabricated at Hallicrafter's 26th Street plant. Three separate tuning units may be plugged into this assembly, any one of which may be selected by the band switch. The panel is joined to the frame so that shafts and controls can be properly placed. This is the extension shaft to the band switch. By the use of this band switch connected to the exciter and driver stages, it's possible to change frequencies very rapidly. That's vitally important in military operation. The final amplifier tuning condenser assembly was built as a unit on the feeder table. It is placed carefully in position. Before this radio frequency deck joins the main assembly line, the standoffs are added. 
The exciter to modulator cable is hooked up. The neutralizing condenser is mounted on the standoffs. The main tube socket is added. Here are the antenna binding posts through which passes the output of the transmitter. This unit is now carefully inspected before it moves into main assembly. Every element, no matter how large or small, is inspected and tested before it goes into a transmitter. When the radio frequency deck joins the main assembly here, the big job is nearly done. A steady flow of finished units has been made possible by intelligent planning of the work at all Hallicrafters plants, perfect coordination with the suppliers and subcontractors, and hundreds of skilled and tireless hands. Now the relays are covered. The smaller tubes are set in place and the completed unit is ready to leave the assembly line. The transmitter is now ready for the first of many tests it will receive before it earns the stamp of final approval. This is the electrical testing room where the transmitter's output, modulation and keying are accurately measured and recorded. This work calls for plenty of technical skill and knowledge. So the staff here is principally made up of experienced radio amateurs. Signal Corps inspectors watch closely these important steps in controlling both the quality and performance of the transmitter. This test measures the radio frequency output of the transmitter. Instead of allowing the signal to radiate over an antenna, these bulbs, called the dummy antenna, convert the RF output into heat. Another important test is the one made for overload. The purpose of this is to make sure the relays respond properly to protect the circuits. This is also done to determine the capacity of the entire transmitter to absorb a temporary overload in normal operation without breaking down. Next, the transmitter is given a trial at sending code signals. When operated in this manner, the audio amplifier and modulator are not used. The flashing of these rectifier tubes shows how the key simply makes and breaks the output to form the characters of the telegraph code. To check how well the transmitter responds to all essential voice frequencies, the oscillograph is used. This detects any distortion and locates at what point the distortion occurs. This transmitter shows a normal frequency response. When the lid goes on the transmitter, that means it has passed all the electrical tests with an A1 rating. It's ready now for the signal core truck. In another part of the plant, radio receivers are being mounted on a table assembly that makes up the listening end of this communication unit. Each table is equipped with two similar radio receivers. One operates on the main power supply and the other from an auxiliary battery. The entire assembly is tested for proper operation as a unit. The two receivers can be operated simultaneously. This is the speech amplifier. Two separate operating positions are provided. Part of the table assembly includes two loudspeakers, two field telephone instruments, and a portable typewriter. This is the final step in assembly, bringing the transmitter, the receivers, and the accessories together and installing them in the truck. Once the equipment is mounted inside this door, it becomes officially the SCR-299. It's on the way to the front. Easy does it. There's no room to spare here and there's plenty more to be put in. Every inch of space is accounted for in this truck and these men know how to use it. A place for everything. 
and everything goes right into place quickly and securely. While the transmitter is being bolted to the floor, the table assembly with its receiving equipment moves in. Accuracy in design and construction makes it possible to save many valuable hours throughout the entire production and assembly of the unit. There goes the wall cabinet that holds the additional operating parts, extra coils, tuning units, condensers. And here's the bench that contains the tools and spare parts, a radio man's hope chest. And this is what it looks like when the operators step in. At the far end, the transmitter with the antenna tuner on top of it. On the right, the wall cabinet. On the floor, the long bench for the operators. Both of these are storehouses for parts and accessories. On the left wall of the truck, the operator's table with two receivers, speech amplifier, control panel, and below, an electric heater and the two field telephones. There goes the SCR-299, out into the field to make its final test on the air. There's just one thing missing. Where's the power coming from? The signal core provides for that in a portable gasoline-driven generator that rides in this trailer behind each truck. This generator supplies standard lighting current, 117 volts AC. A transmitter and receiver that operate on this current can be hooked in to power almost anywhere. Here is the mobile power supply. A remote control from the truck to the generator makes it possible to start and stop the generator at will. The operator prepares for the air test. His first call is to Central Control Station. WXYK, WXYK4, calling for a check on the quality of this transmission and standing by. And here is communication going off to war. Over these ramps roll hundreds of units that will carry the voice of victory to every corner of the earth. Like the champion thoroughbred it is, the SCR-299 rates a whole boxcar to itself. This signal core unit is built for action and to get into action fast. It's a highly mobile radio station and may be set up almost anywhere in battle or invasion activities. Speed is vital. Every minute counts. The enemy doesn't wait. Communications must be ready at all times. It may be the only contact over which a blow-by-blow -blow report flashes from the local front to the remote commands at Cairo, London, Sydney. The SCR-299 in this position is the nerve center of all our attacking forces. Artillery, tanks, infantry, air force, many of which are widely separated. Through the transmitter flow the reports, information, timing, and the order to advance. This is the voice of victory. Contact may be made with an approaching flight of bombers while they're still hundreds of miles away from the target. To coordinate their attack perfectly, these flyers must know the present position of our own tanks, infantry, artillery. They get this information by contact with the message center, which speaks and listens through the SCR-299. Tanks moving into position must be kept informed of the approaching air support. Timing is vital. 
And the timing of all these movements is controlled through this voice by direct contact with the Armored Forces Headquarters. From many small stations scattered miles apart along the battlefronts comes the flash news, the observations, the unexpected, all clearing through this central station. That's how radio helps to time these big movements, make them strike most effectively and with the minimum loss of American lives. Radio communication units are among the first pieces of equipment to go into action whether the attack is on land or sea. Radio communications stay in the fight as long as there are men, guns, ships and tanks on the move. For the life, death or victory of all of them depend upon this command. Get the message through. Perhaps one of the most important messages ever issued is the one you're about to hear from Major General Harry C. Ingalls, Chief Signal Officer of the United States Army. General Ingalls. I'm speaking now as one American soldier to another. For we in the armed forces regard each of you men and women in this audience as being one of us and working shoulder to shoulder with us. You and you alone are responsible for the production and performance of this vital piece of communication equipment. You have seen enough to know what good communication equipment means to the men out there and what it means to victory. You have done a splendid job. Keep up the good work you have been doing. We are asking millions of American soldiers to stake their lives on breaking Germany and Japan. They ask you to keep up your production to the limit of your ability and the high standards of workmanship that have given us an advantage over the enemy that can be measured only on the day of final victory. Remember when amateurs with homemade radio sets used to sit up until all hours of the night talking with other radio hams around the world? How they'd pick up a lad in Fairbanks, Alaska that was someday to ch Pioneering with elements capable of girdling the globe, boys like these held in their hands a weapon that was someday to play an important part in the defense of our land. We begin our story on a day in 1943. Joe Brown and his brother Jim were seniors that year. And like thousands of other American boys, their thoughts were far from the peaceful valley country that has always been their home. Well, you can guess the rest. That Signal Corps poster caught Joe's eye, and it wasn't long before he enlisted. And two days later, Brother Jim walked into a Navy recruiting office, sore as a boil that Joe had beaten him to the punch. Both got their orders to shove off the same day. Naturally, the folks were down to see them leave. Mother used to say that Junior, the youngest, always worshipped his brother Jim. Dad and Mother, of course, were pretty brave about it all.
And so, like millions of other American boys, Jim and Joe... From the drilling they gave the boys those first two months, they didn't feel much like letter writing. To hear Jim tell it, the only time they didn't drill was when they were eating or sleeping. But after the basic training every serviceman has to go through, we got our first real letter from Jim. Jim always was good at letter writing. Dad was so tickled he took the letter down to the war plant where he works to read it to the boys. Jim said, Dear Pop, I'm finally learning how to be a real radio man. From 8.30 in the morning until 4.15 in the afternoon, we go from one class to another. Most of the fellows are around my own age, and I mean we're getting a real education. Pop, a fellow who goes through a school like this gets training that will fit him for most any kind of communications job in what the big shots call the post-war world. The instructors are experts. Most of them have had practical experience with all kinds of radio installations. They know how to get the stuff across so it's understandable. We're taught not only how to repair a piece of equipment under any conditions, but how to build it from the ground up. the big radio manufacturers are working exclusively for the Army and Navy to keep us posted on all the latest improvements. The class in typing and code is what I like best. They shoot the messages slow at first and speed it up until you're taking 24 words a minute. That's tops. After we learn what makes the darn things tick, we get individual instruction on equipment, just the same as they have aboard ship. Pop, speaking of ships, don't think the Army boys are the only ones using walkie-talkies. We have a course in portable equipment that's just as thorough as they come. Not allowed to tell you just how we use them, but believe me, when the war's over, these sets are going to play a pretty important role in communications. Right now, they have a range of about five miles. That's only the beginning. Well, Pop, we're at the end of our fourth month here. The skipper's executive officer came into class today to read off the list of the men who've passed. Honestly, you could have heard a pin drop. Allen, Armitage, Apostopoulos, Bernica, Bernholtz, Blaine. Gosh, I thought he'd never get to my name. And suddenly he said, Jim Brown. And Pop, it was the biggest moment of my life. I made it from the classroom to the barracks and nothing flat. Don't laugh. I had a date with a crow. You see, the crow is what Navy men call a rating. Each man keeps his crow under his mattress until he's earned the right to wear it. When the time comes, he can't get the needle and thread out fast enough. That emblem says, I'm now a radio man, third class. Anytime you see a fellow wearing it, you can bet your boots he knows his stuff. I don't mean that to be bragging, but only the fellows who have gone through a Navy communication school know what it really means to rate it. Next day, with the skipper doing the honors, we marched out on the parade ground to get our diplomas. I wish you could have been there, Pop, but I know you have a war job. And besides, the government doesn't want people traveling around the country unless they have to. Sort of proud of that sheepskin, Pop. I'm mailing it home to you and Mother. Well, we got our orders to shove off today and I'm all packed. I can't tell you where we're going, but I'm on my way. Yes, the folks back home are sort of proud of him, too. It seems that just about the time Jim wrote he'd finished school, 
Brother Joe wrote that he was leaving for maneuvers. A full-fledged sergeant now, earning $98 a month, Joe Brown climbs aboard a radio-equipped scout car as Division X of a mythical Blue Army goes on final maneuvers before sailing overseas. Their objective, to surprise and capture an enemy air force. How radio plays its dramatic role in modern warfare is graphically portrayed as we follow a motorized striking force into the field. Deploying to scout the enemy's flank, two command cars, each armed with a 37mm anti-tank gun, plunge downstream to strike across country. By radio installed in the cars, the patrol is in constant communication with the main force. From his own position, Joe flashes word that the convoy is being attacked by low-flying bombers. Joe's radio report is relayed to the tank command, and reinforcements roll into action. Radio serving in many coordinator of modern battle. Artillery observation post spots the target and by radio corrects the range for gunners miles away. Calling base point, 300 right, 400 short, shell Mach 1. Fuse short, right 40. Message Center Communications Headquarters, officers of the General Staff are kept informed by radio of the battle's progress, are in constant touch with all commanders, know to the minute where each unit is operating in the field. A courier unable to contact his unit dashes back for the nearest portable equipment to get his message through. Position K, Barker, Fred, Barrier, Blue, Williams Landing, cover one. By radio, our sergeant gets the message and contacts a reconnaissance plane scouting the area. Radio, coordinating the action. Radio, making possible combined operations between all branches of the service. AD-7463 reserves assembling. Fire for effect at my command. And by radio, a message plucked from the skies is transmitted to reinforcements waiting to be called up. Here is radio, performing swiftly and efficiently in the heat of battle. Ace point, one right, two short, range 4,000. Fire! Airborne, calling airborne, this is Ridgely White. Airborne, this is Ridgely White. Airport, okay to land. Come on in, over. Yes, radio flies with the paratroops. Lands with the men, ready for instant action. Calling airborne squadron two, Ridgely Black. First wave landed, come on in, over. the thousands of Joe Browns and their radios are helping us win the war. The magic of radio bridging space faster than the most powerful plane.
to radio, Sergeant Joe Brown is able to report, mission accomplished. Nerve center and pulse of our entire communication system are the great Army and Navy message centers in Washington. Messages to and from the high command, transmitted by voice and by code to our fighting forces in all parts of the world. Navy Department, NSS Headquarters, 305. Proceed with operation according to plan. This is Washington, WAR, at H hour, minus 20, execute plan Z, over. And by radio, by all the means of communication known to man, a hundred, a thousand forces begin to move. Supply depots, embarkation points, ships at sea, all ready for... H hour, minus 20, execute plan Z, over. And so, from an unnamed port, troops whose regiments shall also be nameless, board a transport that bears only a number. Plan Z is being put into operation. Dawn finds the convoy at sea. Ships, transports, war vessels spread across the ocean, moving as one. Perfect coordination affected by the magic of radio communication. Overhead, patrol planes. The Navy's big PBYs are on guard. Their crews ready to attack a lurking sub or to flash word by radio of the presence of an enemy raider. Aboard the carrier, flagship of the force, the radio room is on the alert. Promoted to radio man second class, Joe's brother, Jim Brown, is now doing sea duty with the fleet. Now, steaming boldly into enemy waters, warships clear decks for action. Below decks, the music of some man's phonograph tinkles through the crew's quarters. Jim Brown, the boy from Middletown, had the duty the morning the message came through. It wasn't long before the men knew this is it. From the bridge, orders are flashed, and by loudspeakers in every part of the ship, the call is battle station. deck of the flat top, the aerologist gauges the wind. The Airedales are ready for action. Now all they've learned, all they've trained for, is put to the test. Pilots, gunners, radio men know that the honeymoon is over. This time, it's the real thing. batteries swing on target. In the radio room comes final word from the fighter squadrons. Enemy planes attacking in force.
is silenced, the task force is now ready to assault the beach. In landing boats, manned by tough Coast Guard and Navy crews, they prepare for invasion. Troops trained in amphibious operations swarm ashore. This is the pattern for modern war. Landing with the first wave, radio units establish communication with ships offshore. And look who's here, the same Sergeant Joe Brown we last saw training in America. No training camp now. Those machine guns are spitting red-hot lead. Their job done, fighter planes return to the carrier to refuel, rearm, and stand by to repel any new attack from the sky. proceeds according to plan. Troop reinforcements, heavy equipment, big guns and amphibious tanks. Huge 155 millimeter rifles, long toms capable of hurling a shell for more than six miles go into action. Following in the wake of the artillery barrage, jungle fighters press forward, wiping out snipers and enemy pillboxes one by one. From his position ashore, Joe flashes word to the carrier in code. Beach had established. Infantry and heavy equipment landed in force. Operation proceeding according to plan. Situation well in hand. CO reports, enemy positions neutralized. Garrisons in flight. Our patrols following advantage. Yes, it could happen even in wartime. Sergeant Brown, in contact with the radio room aboard the carrier, recognizes his brother's voice. Just like the old ham days, reunion by radio, and in the middle of the South Pacific. And back in Washington, thanks to radio equipment, American men and women of industry, Thanks to the courageous use of radio by the United States Army Signal Corps and the United States Navy Communications Department of the dramatic story of radio at war.